be the change you want to see. Make a difference by giving your money a purpose, a mission to do good. Welcome to Money with Mission, where we talk to individuals, businesses, and organizations who are taking the lead and whose actions are impacting the well-being of their communities and the world at large. Welcome back to Money with Mission. Today I have with me John Kasman. John is a real estate entrepreneur who has partnered with busy professionals to invest in close to $90 million worth of apartments. John hosts the Target Market Insights podcast, where he covers multifamily and marketing insights. In addition, he is a co-creator of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit, a no-pitch event to connect like-minded investors. John has a background in marketing and has overseen campaigns for General Motors, Nike, and Coors Light, amongst others. He was recognized by Black Enterprise Magazine as one of the top executives in advertising and marketing. Welcome, John. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. So John and I met uh, not too long ago after we were both on a top 15 Black hosted podcast. I think John actually wrote the article. Not I think. I know John actually wrote the article <laughs> that talked about that. Let's start right there, John. What made you write that article? Well, a couple of things, you know, um, I mean, you mentioned that uh, previously I've been recognized by the magazine as one of the top executives in marketing and advertising. One of the things that uh, made me write that article in particular was I just really wanted to shine the light on other podcasts with black real estate investors. There are so many people out there. And as we look at where this country has gone over the last few years, with really a, a demand for more representation, whether it be, you know, women's pay, equality, and just really uh, creating a, a fairer landscape, you know, there's this notion that um, some corporations have where it's hard to find uh, diverse talent. And even as someone like myself who is in the industry, you know, I also sometimes struggle finding uh, diverse guests and other diverse podcasts, you know, whether it be, you know, women investors, whether it be, you know, people of color that I want to get onto the show. And I start, I step back and I kind of look at, you know, the, the shows that we had. I'm like, hey, you know what? Not enough people that look like me or not a lot, enough of the people that I want to highlight. So we have to be proactive. And one of the things for me was that, hey, if I'm being proactive and seeking these people out, then I also know that there are other people who are looking for these same kind of shows, looking for a more diverse array of podcasts to listen to, but maybe they don't know who these people are. Maybe they know one or two of them, but they don't know these other ones. So I just wanted to shine a spotlight on some of the podcasts that are out there, different from my show, but you know, equally uh, interesting and uh, worthy in their own right. So we did 15 shows. Yours, of course, is one of the shows that uh, we included in there. And uh, it was a very well-received article, got a lot of great feedback from many of the guests, but as well as many of the listeners who, yeah. you know, got a chance to find and discover new podcasts. And that's something that we are always trying to do. It's really exciting. John was not born a real estate investor, I don't think. No. Um, <laughs> how did you, how long ago and how did you get there? I know you were in corporate America. Talk about how you got into real estate investing. Yeah, real, real short. So I was in corporate America. Uh, I'm a you know first generation kid to go to school, so I'm all of that, right? One of those people who parents, you know, as blue collar as they come. You know, my dad worked at a, an aluminum factory, and uh, his whole thing was, hey, you get a good job, you work until you retire. Well, I went on the corporate side and got hired at General Motors, so I was there, and uh, I was there when we went through those hard times. You know, I was there when we went through bankruptcy, and I watched people get let go, and people who probably were told the same thing that my father taught me. Right? It's like get a good job, you work until you retire. So, those are the lifers. You know, the people who planned on being with that company for life. Yeah. And I saw that even the senior level folks, you know, did not have control over their future. They were getting shipped to. China, I kid you not, one moved from California to Detroit, and a year later, they shipped her to Shanghai. Um, they were being told they had to take early retirement packages. So I realized that, hey, you know what, do you want to have more control over your future? And I thought that was really important. Um, I looked into tech, guess what, not a tech wizard, looked into stocks, way too confusing for me. But real estate was something that was pretty, pretty simple and basic, you know, not easy, but simple. Mm -hmm. So I started reading more and more about real estate, 
going to different events. Um, you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is a, a book many people have read before getting into real estate. Ultimately started investing from there. So I've been investing for about a decade now and, um, you know, started doing it on the side and got to a point about four years ago where I had built up my own portfolio, but it still wasn't producing the kind of passive income I was looking for. Um, I started talking to more of my friends. They were interested in investing in real estate. So I would tell them what to do and how to do it. They weren't really trying to do it. And the light bulb finally went off that they want the passive income, but they do not want to be landlords. And they certainly didn't want to be flipping houses and doing renovation projects and all that crap. So that's when we kind of formed Chasm Capital Group, started working with some of those friends and allowed them to partner with us to buy into these larger apartment deals. And as you mentioned in the bio, we've done about $90 million worth of apartments, partnering with people, everyday professionals who are, you know, from C-suite executives to lawyers, engineers, doctors, um, and, and others who are just looking to get their slice. So one of the things that I, we, I talk about is everybody should have multiple streams of income. And one of those streams of income should to me be real estate. Most people, like you said, don't want to flip a house, be a landlord, get that call. They want to invest passively. So once you've gotten that in your head as an investor, it's like, yes, I want to invest in real estate. No, I don't want to be the person in charge of everything. What do you think, or what would you recommend be the next thing they look for? How do people get into that? We call it deal flow, but how do they get to know somebody that's doing what you're doing and doing what I'm doing? Where do they find those people? Well, this is one of the ideal ways right here, right? You're listening to a podcast. So listen to podcasts, you read books, read articles, you know, Google's a good way to start. I wouldn't say necessarily just do that and run, but if you want to start the process to educate yourself, because there are a couple of things you're trying to do. One, you want to educate yourself so you can learn more about the process, more about what to expect, what to look for in a potential partner or, or potential syndicator. So you want to educate yourself on those things, get to know the kind of deals that they're doing, and then learn more about the way they look at it. Hey, what are you looking for in a deal? What markets are you in? What's your strategy? What's your business plan? You know, you want to understand some of those things and then just step back and ask yourself, does that make sense to me? Mm -hmm. Is that something that aligns with my comfort level? Is that aligned with my risk tolerance? And if so, then you can start to say, okay, well, let me see some of the deals you've done to learn more about you. Let me maybe talk to some references. And then I think you can go from there. But you have to start somewhere. And again, listening to podcasts and you know, looking at some of the guests, that is a great way to at least start to get an initial list. I wouldn't say listen to a show and then just you know write somebody a check. But on the same note, you can start to get to know them a little bit better. Find a handful of folks that you want to vet a little bit further, have a conversation with them, but continue to read and educate yourself. And any good operator should have some resources available to help you in that education process. And I would, I would definitely source from multiple places just to make sure what they're saying, you know, pairs up with what you're reading elsewhere. You know, if someone's saying, oh, you, you know, you can get 20% returns and someone else is telling you, hey, like anybody telling you 20% returns is ridiculous. We can only get seven. Like you just want to read so you can get a, a general sense of, okay, here's typically what my expectations should be. Mm -hmm. Now, let me find the people that I feel comfortable with. Got it. You said a couple of things that I think people have to that people don't necessarily think about. You meet somebody, you talk to somebody, you learn all you can learn, and then you step back and think about what your risk tolerance is. Um, so you definitely need to have as an investor what your own, you have to have a philosophy for yourself. What are you looking for? Why are you investing? It's, you don't invest in anything for just because. There's, there should be a reason for it. Is it a, do you have a tax problem? Are you trying to pay less in taxes? Are you, look, do you need cash flow? Are you looking straight for appreciation? And so you, you have to answer those questions for yourself. And then you can go out and look and find somebody who matches you in that category. But one of the big things to me with syndicators and operators is you want to know and trust and like that person because you're going to relate, you're marrying that person. Even if you don't look at them every day and sleep with them, you're married to that person for as long as your money is tied up in their deal. So that to me is one of the best things about what we do is that we get to know our investors. We want to know who they are. We want to know what they're doing. And I suspect that John would say, if you're if what you're looking for doesn't match his deal or what he's doing, he's going to tell you that, that it's not a match and help you find someplace that does. Um, so that's the biggest thing to me about real estate investing as private equity. 
Yeah, and to your point, I mean, syndication is just one tool, right? I mean, it, you, like, it's not that passive investing means syndication. There are a lot of different things you can do. So we want the people who certainly align with this because I want I want happy clients, right? I want I want happy investors. And if you invest with me, and then three months later you realize there's something else you really wanted to do, well, that's going to put a strain on both of our relationship, right? So I, I don't want that. I want happy investors. I want to make sure you're educated, make sure you have the information you need to make a sound investment choice for you and your family. And that's really what we're trying to do. But, you know, we want to understand the risk tolerance, your time horizon. You know, when do you expect to get the money back? Do you need cash flow, want some cash flow? Um, because there may be other things. Or you, someone who is solely focused on the highest return possible, because guess what? That's not going to be us. Yeah. You know, there are other ways to make the highest return, but with higher returns comes higher risk. So, you know, we like to focus on the Midwest where there's really good cash flow, but we can still force appreciation through, you know, making some updates to the property. But we're buying properties that are cash flow on day one. They're 90% plus occupied. They're making money. We're just coming in and tweaking the business operation so that it can make more money. If you really want to make the most amount of money, then you should get into ground up development or, you know, hard money lending or something like that, where there's way more risk involved because the property is not making any money right now. And someone's going to build something or create something out of thin air. And then once that's done, they'll refinance or whatever they're going to do to sell and, and pay you out. So there's different strategies and you have to figure out what your comfort level is. For us, we like buying properties that make money day one where we can still make more money in the future, that gives us comfort. We can sleep at night knowing that we can pay the bills. We're protected in the sense of any changing environment, climates, you know, if uh, interest rates change or whatever the things may happen, we feel like we have some, some insulation there versus someone who is doing um, higher risk projects where some of those changes happen if their projects get delayed and, you know, they just have more risk. And I'm someone who flipped properties. And when I flip, I didn't do as well because of those kind of factors, you know, project gets delayed, contract issues, whatever, but I wasn't making money. So mm -hmm. I just delayed that process further. So I'm, for me personally, it's really important to buy, get into projects where we're making money up at the front and then we're just going to implement a business plan that allows us to make more money. And for you, it might be something different, but you know, you have to figure out your own philosophy. Yes, 100%. Your, each investor has a philosophy of what they're trying to do, what they're trying to get to. And every syndicator has a philosophy of what they're trying to do, why they do what they do. And whatever your deal is, whatever your idea of what you're trying to do, there is somebody who's doing it and there's somebody who's doing it well. You just got to find them. So one of the things I'd like to do is get to know as many people as I, as I can who are syndicating, who are doing ground up development, doing what John does and buying something that's already making money. I'd like to know as many of those as I can so that I can introduce investors to those people that I know and trust and just transfer that trust on to that operator syndicator. Um, <clears throat> social impact, John. So you do multifamily investing um, and I, I'm social impact. I like grocery stores and food deserts, getting people fed, healthcare, taking all of these are kind of things that I go through with businesses and real estate. Are you, do you have any direct social impact? Multifamily investing, let me say, because I think about this a lot, is social impact. If you buy a property and you take care of it and you give people someplace to live, that's an impact. All, all real estate is social impact. Do you have any more specific things that you do, John? or and your group does or are you in that spot where i just talked about yeah so there's a couple ways of looking at that so one i think that all of us you know if you're successful and i'll let you define success however you want to define it but if you're successful i believe that there's an obligation to help others in some capacity achieve a moderate level of success as well whether that's through mentorship whether that is through social impact or whatever causes that you know you you're excited about, we should all do something to to help others, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned being kind of a you know first generation to go to college, so those kind of things are really important to me because I recognize the amount of people that were along the way to help me get to the next step. Because I had no clue, I didn't know how to fill out an application for college. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like so there were a lot of people who sat down, took time out of their days, out of their lives to help me get to the next step. So. I think it's really important to help with different causes like that. 
Money with Mission is a real estate and business investment company that specializes in finding projects that have the potential to give you a great return on your investment dollar and make an impact in the communities where we invest. Make a difference in your life and the lives of others. Go to moneywithmission.com to learn more. So what we do is I'm actually on a board for an organization, uh, the advisory board for an organization called Search for Water. And it is a nonprofit that really invests in sustainable water solutions in underserved countries. So we are in uh, the Philippines, the Dominican Republic, Uganda. Um, we are you know, really trying to help out where we can build into these communities where they can be self-sufficient. You know, there's a difference between um, shipping in water and bringing in water and teaching people how to filter their own water and create a sustainable, um, you know, uh, ecosystem that allows them to thrive and actually allows us to pull out and let them live. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm really excited about. So what we do personally is we take a portion of the funds that we do, we have projects. You mentioned the Midwest Summit. The summit in particular is one where we take a portion of the proceeds and we donate it directly into the field to create, um, you know, um, uh, different water programs. Uh, we have wells that we will will fix up and um, all sorts of different things that we do with that program. But that's one is with Search for Water. And then as far as our real estate, you know, part of part of what we try to do is be a part of the solution, not the problem. So. I'm not a person who looks for uh, properties where there's going to be some gentrification that takes place. Um, I'm all about beautifying communities, um, but I'm not about displacing current residents. Uh -huh. And there's a fine balance there. There's a dance because, you know, some would argue that we have an affordable, affordable home issue, which is why you have people who are looking at these communities in the first place. But on the same note, if you're displacing people who are already there you know, you just, you, you fix one problem, but maybe you've created another problem. So there are ways about that. And there are other folks who are dedicated to, you know, improving communities and, and keeping the current residents in place. There's a lot of um, logistics involved in that. So that's just something we've made a conscious decision to say, hey, we don't want to be the people who come into a neighborhood fix it up and then charge $500 more rent. That's not really something that we could do and sleep well at night. So we don't do that. Um, we try to make sure that we're looking at places where, where we're creating that value. It's truly about making a com community better, um, improving the, the housing stock that's there, but also being able to retain the current resident base, no matter what the makeup of that resident base is. So we try to, we try to shoot for that in most of the deals that we do. Awesome. That's great. So I'm, I'm living in Tulsa, Oklahoma right now. This is June 1st. It is the commemoration of the Tulsa race massacre that occurred in 1921 over the 31st and 1st. Um, wiped out a entire, really called, called Black Wall Street, but wiped that out completely. And to me, wiped out this lead of generational wealth. I mean, just taking that down has taken um, the, the residents of Tulsa over time, it's just, it's, it's coming back now. And I, I believe it came back at some point, but there's just been um, a lack of growth and economic development in North Tulsa where I live. We put, we put the first grocery store here in 10 years, just opened a couple of weeks ago. What, do you, what are your thoughts on the economic disparities um, between ethnicities was like race disparities let's call it what what it is here how what, what are your thoughts on that well i'm a midwest kid right so i grew up in cleveland um i went to school in dayton detroit you know lived in chicago for the last eight years and i'm in cincinnati now and in every single one of those cities you know um you know familiar with the term rust belt grew up with it right and understood the economic disparity in those markets as well and you know, it's challenging because you've got so many layers to it. I mean, you talked about, you know, the commemoration of what happened in Tulsa and something I didn't even know about as a kid, right? I didn't learn about that until I was an adult. I never even heard of that. Yep. Um, and it's like, how come this wasn't taught, you know, which is its own question. But anyway, for me, 
coming up and finally getting into corporate America, which was my goal, right? It's like getting corporate America and you're set basically. Yep. As I got into that flow and was looking around and starting to become more aware of, you know, everything, you know, politics and, the, you know, corporate politics and then, you know, government politics and so many other aspects of, of life the wealth gap started to come up, right? Because you, I mean, you see it from every step from, you know, two people being hired at a company and there's a, there's a pay gap for the same role. You know, the, the, the race wealth gap is just crazy. And for those who aren't as aware, uh, the, the last time I saw the numbers, it's been a little bit, but I believe that for people with the same salary, and I believe the, the median salary was like $42,000 or something like that. And it was for a white person making $42,000 and a black person making $42,000. The white person would have eight times more wealth than the black person. And we talk so much about the pay gap and shooting for a $15 minimum wage. And I feel like the public just ignores the wealth gap. And to me, that is so big because it's not about the education. Yeah, it's a start, right? It's a start. But you're telling me I can go to college, I can go to get my master's degree, I can, you know, do all of these things. And I finally land that job. And the person to my left, who, you know, did the same stuff is basically 10 times ahead of where I'm at. Day one, right? And it's, 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 um, and it's no knock on them. Like, I want to be crystal clear. That's, that's not a knock on anyone else is just to say that, Hey, you're starting from, you know, behind. And part of that is really driven through real estate because real estate is the number one wealth driver in this country. And the reason that wealth gap exists is because many of them have either inherited homes or they've had equity that they've been able to get from parents or grandparents who've been able to pay for college because they've been mm -hmm. able to take out a home equity line mortgage or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have different means available to you. You know, for me, I had to take out my own loans, right? My own student loans. There was no money sitting around waiting for me to go to college. So I had to take out all my own loans. Right. So mm -hmm. again, this is not a pity party. I don't, that's not the intent. I'm just, I want to illustrate that, you know, that's why there's a gap. And for a lot of people, it's difficult if you don't have any assets, if you don't inherit anything, if you don't get a boost from family members, it's tougher for you to start. And the number one way to address that, school is great, education is great, um, but you have to invest. You have to invest in income producing, appreciating assets. And real estate is one of those things that can actually help you. And for those individuals who are successful, and if you're listening to this podcast, I'm talking to you because if you've established a certain amount of success in your career, you now have to look at your wealth. I'm not talking about just salary. I'm talking about the wealth, the assets that you own minus the liabilities and see where you're at. And you need to accumulate more assets and in particular income producing assets, though so you can weather any storms. You know, what good is it to have um, you know, gold or, or cars or whatever it is that you own. And certainly it's an asset and has value, but it doesn't give you any money. It can't produce a check for you. And the only way to get money is to sell it. Like, no, you need something that brings you in checks, you know, mm -hmm. each week, each month, each quarter. And that's why I push so hard for, for real estate. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. That's just, just broke it down. It is not about how much money you make it is that it's building your wealth that is the key that what we often do not do we get to that salary and we're happy with that salary and you buy more and more doodads as it's called in cash flow um things that do not put money in your pocket things that ultimately they they, bring, they make you happy for the time when you buy them it's a you know and i'm not a, i'm not knocking buying things that make you happy at all because I do it we all do it but you have to have something that's putting money in your pocket on a regular basis that it's what John said cash flowing assets in your pocket that are there and things that you can pass down leave a legacy to your children leave a legacy teach them about that so that we can we can overcome this wealth gap that we have and this is this is for everybody it's just everybody anybody who's doing this making a lot of money and just spending all the money they make that you've got to do better
And I would say too, I mean, you, you've got, um, you've got the gender gap as well, which is a little bit different, but I mean, we know women live longer than men. Um, you're, you're going to, you know, work a little bit longer. If you're a mother, you know, you may take a little bit of time off for maternity leave and have some other things there. So that's a whole other challenge where if you're a woman, you know, you've got to look at it as well, not to just be solely dependent on, you know, that salary, uh, or, you know, a spouse relationship or whatever it is, because, you may live longer, 10 years longer. My wife's, my wife's mother is, you know, still alive. And, uh, you know, her, her father passed away like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, to, to, to do the math of what realistically could happen, what your outlook is, you have to plan way more and beyond and set yourself up for these things. So it, there's multiple layers to the, the wealth gap. And I just think it's really important for people to recognize it and plan for the future. And as you mentioned, we all like the toys. Uh, a buddy of mine was just, he just did this amazing video. Um, he's got a company called Black CEO that he just launched. He did this amazing video where he talked about buying a Mercedes G-Wagon uh, mm -hmm. once he got his first big payday, right? He went out and got a Mercedes G-Wagon. And um, he talked about just feeling like he deserved it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things too, is like, you know, you want to stand out. If you've accomplished, if you've overcome you kind of want to just show the world, you know what? I deserve this. You see yeah. what I did. You see what I've accomplished. And that's great. And that's a lovely feeling. But I'm telling you, owning some income producing assets, that's another good way to do it too, baby. I'm telling you. <laughs> I will, you, you get your slice of a, of, a, of a $10 million apartment building, you'll feel like you made it as well. I promise. Your checks come in the mail. And every time a check gets the mail or hits your bank account, you look in there like, wow. I got money. I have a friend of mine who invests with me. Who's like, uh, it took a long time to get her to invest, but once she started investing, now she looks in her bank account and many people do this, look in their bank account. It's like, Oh, I've got money. I'm good. She looks in her bank account and knows I've got too much money in my bank account. I've got to buy something. That's an asset. Money in a bank account is not an asset. Long-term, uh, right. short-term it is long-term it's going down in value. Um, God, there was something else I was going to ask you, John, and it went away. Oh, my. Um, okay. We talked about wealth gap. We talked about women. One of the big things for women, like you said, is we live longer than our guys a lot of the time. And a large majority of women are in poverty at that point, And they're not able to, to take care of themselves, depending on the government to take care of them. We need to stop that. We need to end that. It's the, the government's a backup plan to me. It's, it's not your first plan, it's the backup plan. So multiple streams of income, income producing properties um, to me are the way to go. And as John's talking, the way to go too. Hey, John, I really appreciate this. What do you have for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, we talked earlier about, you know, how do you get more familiar with the investing process and things like that? Well, we have a sample deal package on our website. So you can check that out at casvincapital.com slash sample deal. And if you're interested in being a passive investor and just kind of want to see like, okay, what kind of things should I be looking for when I look at an opportunity or, you know, what questions pop up? Um, I think it's a great way just to start getting more familiar with the process and what to expect. You can check that out there. Or if you want to be active and you want to do your own deals, um, it's another great way of learning what to think about, what kind of information you need to answer and how to prepare yourself to do a deal. But you can check it out at kasmancapital.com slash sample deal. We'll have that in the show notes. And you could also get it if you go to moneywithmission.com. We'll get you over there so you can get what he's, what John's got. And again, that is a perfect way. You have to, once you've made the decision that you want to be an investor and you've decided you want to be a passive investor, you've got to start then educating yourself on what's the next steps. Meet people, talk to people. Don't, don't hear somebody on a podcast like John says and they go write them a check. That's, no, you got to get to know them. Okay, I'm not going to go into 401ks, but just like I think you should know, whoever's got your 401k money. To me, that's putting money in a suitcase and handing it off to somebody that you don't know and trusting them to do something with it. It's not a good way to deal with your money. John, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. Um, John, all of John's contact information will be in the show notes, his website, his podcast, um, how to get his um, deal packet. And it is a sample deal packet, right? There's nothing active in there. That's right. Okay. Yes. And yeah. then how to get in touch with him. If you like John and want to get to know him more and invest with him, that all, all that information will be there too. Thanks for listening. And until next time, give your money a purpose. You've been listening to Money with Mission. There are projects happening right now 
where you can make a great return while positively impacting the lives of others. To learn more about today's guests or to download 7 Steps to Building Resilient Wealth for Women, visit www.moneywithmission.com. I hope you enjoyed the interview and are inspired to give your money a mission. Until next time, send your investment dollars into the world to bring you a financial return and improve the lives of others.